The War is Over, the Stonehouse Series, Chapter 41. This is the final chapter of my journey. Jesus gazed in through the city gates and toward the temple walls beyond. Three years ago, I entered Jerusalem through this gate. Once, I painted for them a picture of my mission when I transformed six jars of dirty water into wine, then washed my father's temple with a whip. Must I clean it now again? Father, the shepherds of your people have not received me, but I will follow where you lead and fulfill my chores along the way. The Son of God, with his twelve, entered the arena of his final destination. From where Jesus and his twelve now stood, everything before them expressed the most magnificent of architectural craftsmanship seen in any century. At each side were massive walls constructed of bordered stone. Each block, often weighing in excess of 40 tons, all presenting perfect joinery of master craftsmen. The accumulative lifetime accomplishment of countless master stonemasons. On display and 100 yards ahead was presented the treasure which these massive walls silently guarded. Israel's Jerusalem Temple, a masterpiece of engineering and wealth exhibited genius. To the naked eye, everything seen presented life and present tense perfection. But this was not the temple built by Solomon at the direction of Jesus' father. Nor was this the rebuilt temple raised up after Solomon's temple was destroyed. This was the replacement of the rebuilt temple authorized by the same Herod whom Emil had encountered, the man responsible for the murder of his son. Herod, a descendant of Jacob's twin brother Esau. Herod was the husband of ten assorted wives and a father to more than a dozen children of whom he had murdered several of both. Herod's kingship was forced upon the nation of Israel by the power of Rome. The consequences inflicted by his leadership while it influenced the building of a magnificent structure and impenetrable walls, it carried with it a tremendous cost in decadence. The depravity of Herod and his sons, who now ruled after him, overflowed on those placed or allowed to be in positions of authority and power. Emil's episode with the 24 spring lambs was only a minor infraction, when piled next to the mountain of wickedness perpetrated upon the very people the priests of God's temple were appointed to be shepherd to. Through extensive posturing of their outward exposure, they presented a picture of high and lofty holiness, while their spirits were dead and their hearts were corrupt beyond measure. This was the atmosphere that Jesus and his twelve now entered into. His twelve rocked along, gawking, each step through the expansive 37 acres of splendor brought more jaw-dropping amazement. The complex they were scrutinizing had been under construction for 49 years at this point, and it would take another 31 years to finish it completely. Work progressed with a crew of up to 10,000 slaves, plus paid workers all spread across the many preparations, the fabrications, and the construction zones. On this day, a huge block of bordered stone was being maneuvered into place on a segment of the one-mile wall, which surrounded the entire compound. Peter and several of the others stopped to watch as 200 men, plus animals, strained to gently slide the 40-ton stone into its resting place. It was only 
one of thousands cut from Mount Moriah, the giant rock which had been above and behind the Temple Mount. Moriah was slowly being cut away and shaped into the massive stone blocks which the walls were constructed of. The remanufacturer of Jerusalem's temple had been the first phase of construction. From a remote quarry, each white block of stone for the entire temple was cut, shaped, numbered, and sorted, ready for assembly. This was done before the second temple, built following the time of the prophet Ezekiel and after the Jews' release from Babylon, was dismantled and replaced with the new temple. That construction phase was complete before Jesus was seen by the prophetess called Anna. Eventually, the group came to the expansive stairway leading up to Solomon's porch. The 12 lined up across the first step, all 12 on one step. They spread out a bit to fill the entire space. And from there, they began, in unison, to walk up the stairway and eventually over the road below. In some sort of procession, they took a breath, stepped up into the next step and paused, took a breath and stepped up to the next step, eventually reaching the top. Solomon's porch stretched out before them. Hundreds of giant columns in four rows supported a massive timbered roof. Peter and Andrew ran up to the first column. Together, they tried to reach around it, but they couldn't quite touch each other's fingers. John was overwhelmed. He walked in circles as they progressed across the elevated second floor. Sauntering up to Jesus, he wrapped an arm around his shoulder and said, Jesus, this place is huge. There has to be two or 3,000 people here just on Solomon's porch. And it's, it's not even close to being crowded. The other 11 disciples gathered around, waiting to hear what their master would say about the fantastic buildings. Jesus was seeing things from a slightly different perspective through the revealing eyes of Spirit Helper. Tell me, John, why didn't King David Build for my father the first temple. Uh, because he had blood on his hands? Well, that's what's written. David was a man of war. Was he a faithful man? Uh, he is called a man after God's own heart. Can you see him, John? As a barefoot shepherd boy, he learned to lead while guarding sheep. Anointed to be king. He killed giants. He inspired the people of my father to live, to win, and to do the things that was right. John, even though it was his heart's desire, my father told David that he could not build for him a temple, and he said it would be Solomon, David's son, who built for him a temple. Yes, that's true, answered John, wondering where Jesus was going. What about the second temple? Was that built according to my father's instructions? The people, after they were released from being slaves in Babylon, at first they neglected rebuilding the temple. They did their own stuff first, and it cost them. Then God, through a prophet, told them to build the temple first, and then the other stuff would fall in line. They were standing in the center of Solomon's porch now. Peter studied the massive cedar logs within the roof structure. Those cedar log rafters were supported by the log columns which he and Andrew had tried to reach around. And with his head tipped back, Peter slowly turned in a circle while gawking up into the roof structure. How in the world did they put those giant logs up there? They are humongous, big, and absolutely beautiful. Jesus pulled John to the center of his question. So, so tell me, where did this nation receive the instructions to tear down that temple 
and to build this one. John, with trepidation, answered, The first Herod offered to do it, I guess. It was uh, his idea. Tell me of your father's brother. Curious of Jesus' questioning and John's obvious apprehension, the eleven pulled in close to hear what was coming next. Not wanting to meet Jesus' penetrating gaze and shifting to his right, John answered, I never met him, but he didn't like the eagle. I know that much. Jesus pressed, and what eagle was that? Now this was a memory John didn't want to remember. It revealed the eternal condition of many powerful people. Powerful people who said things, things which listeners wanted to believe were true, but within their heart they knew those words were only spiced up devil lies. The actions of those leaders eventually proved the corruption of their heart. <sighs> the eagle, the one that used to be over the entry into the temple, nobody liked it. Herod shouldn't have put it there. John went silent for a moment, scanning his surroundings, calculating, taking note of who was listening, concerned that he would be hauled away for speaking so forcibly about what the previous Herod had done. It was a giant Roman imperial seal emblem. He should have never put well, the thing well over the doorway into God's temple. And what did your uncle do about it? 28 years ago, when Herod was dying, my uncle, along with about 40 others, they went to tear the eagle down. And the man who offered to build this temple, how did he respond? Well, it was a thing never talked about, not out in the open, not if you wanted to live, but this, well, really, it was never far from John's thinking. John answered while staring at the ground. The Roman soldiers arrested all of them, all of the men. Herod ordered that they be tied to poles and in front of his palace. And he had wood piled up around them, ordered the soldiers to light them up, and Herod burned them all, all of them. He burned them all alive. Now tell me, John, do you believe my father would have chosen Herod over David or Solomon to build him a temple? No, sir. That would be terribly out of character for him, answered John timidly. Jesus started walking again, moving towards the northeastern corner of Solomon's porch, he maneuvered the group so that they could look over the wall and down into the Cedron Valley. Parts of the wall were over 30 feet thick and 100 feet tall. Directly across the valley, they could see the Mount of Olives. Jesus explained, There have been more people than you can count, many of them good people, my father's people, they poured their blood, sweat, and tears into building this place. They will not be forgotten, nor lose their reward, but the primary motivation behind the building of it was a corrupt man building a monument to himself. Yes, sir, answered John, considering the thousands of people who died working with these massive stones. I hear you. Peter asked, Wasn't it the third Herod who had John the baptizer arrested and murdered for declaring it was wrong for Herod to marry his brother's wife? John considered, Yes, I think so, although it could have been the second. It gets a little confusing as to which Herod is which when they keep naming themselves hero or the offspring of a hero. And then they make everyone around them call them hero, the son of a hero. When I look at that man and consider what he is like and the things that he has done, I know this, he is not my hero. 
Jesus addressed his twelve, Look around you and watch. Men gather together to do the will of man. And now consider this. As soon as they finish piling these stones up, they will all be torn down, with not one stone left on top of another. And why? Because they have not known the day of their visitation, when God walked this earth as a man. Neither have they sought the will of my Father. If they looked for him, even now, they would see me, and they would see my Father. Peter questioned, And what of the people this morning? They cut branches from the trees, laid them on the ground in front of you. The children were dancing circles around you on that donkey. Their parents spread their coats on the ground in your path. They were shouting and hollering and praising you as Messiah, the Christ. They were so loud. The Pharisees got all bent out of shape, tried to shut them up and to be quiet. Have they seen you? Jesus answered Peter, What the children presented was real, for it came from the simplicity of their understanding. Most of their parents are looking and hoping for someone to be the king, like David, to send Rome home like a whipped dog with its tail between its legs. But they don't understand the scope or placement of my father's kingdom. And what did you tell those Pharisees this morning? Jesus was looking at the massive stones cut from Mount Moriah from behind the temple. The mountain where Abraham set Isaac on the altar, a willing sacrifice. Mount Moriah was being broken up for the building of a wall. I told them that if the people stopped from praising me, then these stones would immediately cry out in praise to me instead. From Solomon's porch, Jesus pulled by spirit helper to walk through the temple complex, seeing all things through his father's eyes. The thoughts, the intents of each heart were all laid bare. Pharisees and Sadducees, money changers and vendors, people selling doves for sacrifices, sometimes selling the same dove 20 or 30 times. Some vendors were selling doves only once. Others were selling lambs or selling the services of a lamb inspector for those who brought their own lamb. They were surrounded with the sale of all things that could be sold for a price, for the sale of what could be done for a price. In all of this, everything and everyone was uncovered before the eyes of Jesus. After several hours of observation, he went back to Bethany and Stone House with the Twelve. From the center of the soul were observed countless gardens, many filled with thistles and thorns of every shape and type, but very few gardens willing to go to God and receive from him a crop failure and new seed to sow. Why?